Two weeks ago, I started uh, just speaking around this whole thing of uh, the why seasons, especially the, the seasons where we ask God why. And if we really wanted to ask ourselves, every single one of us asks God why at some point in our lives. And there's nothing wrong with asking why. It's okay to ask why. Uh, the danger is when we move from asking why, uh, when we ask God questions to when we question God. When we kind of put God on the witness box and we, and we start interrogating God. Uh, which is something what Job did. Job, Job and, and his friends were, they, they, they moved into this place of self-righteousness and self well, especially Job. Self-righteousness, his friends had their own self-righteousness. They were like, well, Job, we must have really messed up for this to have happened. And they had all these big philosophical, humanistic reasonings about why what had happened to Job had happened to Job. But at the end of the day, they were questioning God's character. They were questioning who God was. And so God comes along and starts the way God brings Job back to a place of repentance is he questions Job. He says, well, if you're so clever and so smart, let me question you. Were you there when I laid the foundations of the deep? I asked that for a question to start off with, like, duh, duh, must answer that. <laughs> and God gives all these questions and Job realizes very, very quickly into this that this is not a fair boxing match. And he realizes that for this whole period of time, he's been quite deluded in thinking that he's able to kind of explain himself away um, amongst his prayers, so when God steps into the equation and says, okay, cool, you are as clever as you, as you think you are, um, let me ask you some questions. And he, we realize again just the greatness and the goodness of God. And uh, Job moves back to the place of, I don't understand the things that happen, but I don't even understand, I need to understand God's character. And that's really the thing that I, I'm really trying to go after as we're thinking about these things is, is that we go, we, we move back to this place of my trust is in the character of God, my trust is in is in his promises over my life. Uh, in the seasons where there's things I don't understand. And if we are honest with ourselves, we all go through seasons where there's things that we don't understand, right? Yeah. So so that, that's really something that I've been I've, I've been just thinking about and processing. And when I started the message two weeks ago, I realized I was never gonna finish it. So today we're gonna get we're gonna hit the punchline. Um, you know, we're gonna really go after a couple of things. And we use the story of David as our, our launch pad, where David um, had his group of mighty men and uh, they arrived back at the place where they were staying to discover that their families, their wives, their children, all, all their possessions, everything had been taken. Um, a group of people had come in and just wiped, wiped, just taken everything away. So they'd taken everything and taken, and kidnapped them and gone. And David's men were so upset and broken and bitter in spirit, which you can understand. When you come home and your family's not there, you're the, the but everything, everything that, that you hold valuable and important is, is gone, been taken. And in that day and age, taken usually meant killed, dead, you've lost it all forever, you know. And they were so, so, not angry at David necessarily, but so, but angry at the situation that they needed to take it out on someone and they were talking about stoning David. And you can imagine David must have been thinking, honestly, God, why, why is this happening? Why is this on the go? But the Bible says that they can strengthen himself for the Lord. And my prayer for you and for me is that we will move into a place where we are able to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. In the middle of confusion, in the middle of chaos, in the middle of the loss, that we will learn how to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. And, and it really isn't that complicated. It's not that complicated to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. But so often we, because we... Um, we, we move, sometimes move from that childlike faith where it's okay to ask why sometimes to that place where, um, no, this doesn't make any sense because I've done this and I've done that and I've dotted all the I's and I've crossed all the T's and uh, I go to church every second Sunday and uh, I do my thing. And we think because of all of that, I don't deserve what's coming my way. And we, we ask all these big philosophical questions. But actually, deep down inside, what's happening is we question the character of God. The questioning is God who he says he is. And something that I find really incredible about Jesus, when I look at how Jesus responds to this, is that Jesus, in our asking questions of God, often what happens is Jesus asks questions back at us. And he asks us questions because what he's trying to do is move us to a place of realizing um, that what we're thinking is a lack of trust in God. What we're thinking is we, we don't actually believe it's a, 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 something of God's character to really be true about God. So when God asked, when, when, when God, when Jesus asked the question, and we, we, we dealt with three questions last week, and we did the other three today, um, let's just start with the third question we asked, why are you afraid? 
When he asks, why are you afraid? He wants, he's wanting his disciples to, to really just realize that they shouldn't be at a place where they are afraid. They shouldn't be afraid. Because if they're afraid, it means that they don't think Jesus is who he says he is. Why are you afraid? In other, words, in other words, do you not believe that I am who I say I am? Do you not believe that I'm able to protect you even in the middle of a storm? And when we ask our questions, and question them in this way, we can say, oh God, look what's happened to me, look what's happened in my life. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 the questions that we ask them is because we lost sight of a characteristic of God. We've lost sight of His faithfulness. And it's easier. We were eight months down the line from when lockdown first started. And throughout these eight months, it's been really, really easy to, to, to lose sight of the promises of God, lose sight of something of what the future of God could look like. And possibly start to feel a little bit like, um, you know, God isn't maybe as good as He is, as he says He is in my life. Um, I can see His favor on that person's life, but in my life, maybe it's just kind of overlooking me. And what we're really doing is we start to question His character. And the way Jesus wants to bring us to a place of truth is He asks us questions. And so as I've gone through these, the three questions last week, which I'll read again now, and then the three questions we're going to do today, they're questions that Jesus is asking us so that we can see and so that, we'll, that, that lies can be exposed inside of us, so that we can see where we actually are at. And not so that it can be this big, long process of going to take the next year to deal with, but that we can deal with it in a moment. So God, I, 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 repentance doesn't have to be a six-month process. Repentance can be a one-second process. God, I lost sight. I, and, and sometimes, I mean, when we do see it so clearly, we will ask ourselves the question, how did we even land our question God in that way? Yeah. Uh, and then the, the, the point is not to beat ourselves up and get all the shame and feel all guilty and stay away from church for six weeks. But to go straight away, God, I am, I repent. I, I, I'm, I'm back. I, I realize, I don't, I don't realize how I turned so fast to this, to, to this place of question. I am, I'm back and I'm focused on it. And I'm trusting you again. The first question that we asked last week was, or two weeks ago, is why do your eyes wonder? Eyes of wonder as W A N D R. Wonder. Why do they, why do they look around? Why do they look around? And we looked at the story of, of um, uh, the, the master who gives the same reward to some people who worked very little and some people who worked a lot. He gives the same, the same, he pays them all the same amount. And he asks them the question the guys who got the same amount, even though they worked the whole day, when they, they get all upset now, they start to grumble. He says, Why is your eye evil? Because I'm good. Why is your eye evil? Because I'm good. Why, why do you have wondering eyes? Why are you looking at my favor on that person and then looking at yourself and saying, well, I, I deserve more? Which is a religious mindset. But I did more, so I deserve more. That's religion. And the answer to that is we've got to bring our eyes back onto Jesus. And we, we've got our neighbors and our friends and people in our lives and, and we see what God is doing in their lives and we celebrate what he does in their lives and we keep our eyes on him because he's a good God. He's a good father. So I'm not going to allow my eyes to wonder. I'm not going to have an evil eye. Why is your eye evil? Because I'm good. I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. And, but God, so much good kind of goes that person's way. Week after week, month after month, year after year. And what happens is we go out of Jesus and we celebrate that. I celebrate God, your goodness in that person's life. I celebrate God, your favor in that person's life. I celebrate the year of the year of the year. Because I also know that you are good. And the more you pour out of that person, doesn't mean it's less for me. Because there is endless, uh, uh, there's endless abounding resource in you. And there is enough for me to start and keep my eye on you. Why is your eye evil? Because I'm good. Put our eyes back at Jesus. The second question that, that Jesus could ask us is, why do you make decisions from a place of discouragement? Why do you make decisions from a place of discouragement? Um, it's, it's so easy to get discouraged. And sometimes in those moments of discouragement, you make major life decisions. We go, Move to New Zealand. Okay. Uh, we make these. Yeah. <laughs> you agree with me or are you moving? I don't want to do that. <laughs> 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 oh, I love this mess. <laughs> you know, and, and, and uh, we've said this so many times here that if God tells you to move, if God tells you to sell up and go there, if God tells you to make that decision. If God tells you to leave that job, move to that job, 
then, then do it because God said so. But don't make decisions from a place of discouragement because you will, it, will, it will never be beneficial. Make a decision from a place of discouragement will always lead to, to confusion, will always lead to that, will never lead to the abundance of life that God has for us. And I've seen this over and over again, <laughs> not just the Celeste situation, I've seen this over and over again, where people are just like, I don't, I don't see a future, I don't see a hope, I'm just going to. And that is a place of discouragement. The place from where we need to make decisions is from a place of encouragement. Yeah. To recognize that even when we face, there, there is no such thing as a hopeless situation, there's only hopeless people. And the situation that has to change, the situation has to change on the inside of us. Yeah. On the inside of us. That way we remain, we can, be, we can be full of hope. So we've got to move back to a place of encouragement. And Jesus, uh, or, or whoever wrote Hebrews, says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Think about how much Jesus went through. Consider him who, made, who endured such hostility. Jesus went through so much, we barely understand what he went through. Our finite minds can't really cope with and comprehend what he actually went through. We do our best to try and understand what we, what we can't cope but we've got to keep considering. Keep considering him. Keep considering that. And it goes on to say, so that we not become weary and discouraged. The reason why we become weary and discouraged is because we stop considering what Jesus went through on our behalf so he could give us what, what, what we need for life. Amen? Okay, so that was the second question. The third question, I'm trying, I'm trying to go quick because I don't want to rehash two weeks ago, but just to have set the platform. And if you didn't miss that, you need to uh, go and listen to it. Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Jesus says to the disciples when they're on the boats, why are you afraid when you of little faith? And sometimes Jesus can be right there with us and we still feel lonely, lost, and afraid. Yeah. And it's not... The, the presence of God in our lives doesn't necessarily mean that everything's going to go great. You can have the presence of God in your life and be in the middle of a storm. And it's those moments where we need to stop and remember that I'm in a storm, but He's here with me. He's here with me. And it can happen to the disciples, it can happen to you, it can happen to me. And Jesus doesn't say, Yeah, I can understand you being a little bit afraid. This is quite a hectic storm. He doesn't come alongside and do a bit of a counseling session with them. And like, tell me how you feel. Pour it out. Pour it out. Tell me how you feel. No, he just, he stops it. He's, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? We can fix this in a moment. But you need to step out of the place of fear back into the place of faith. Yeah. Back into the place of faith. Back into the place of trust in me. So that, that's where we got to uh, two weeks ago. And I'm going to move on to the fourth question. The fourth question is, why are you worried? Why are you worried? I'm so worried about things. I'm so worried that there's this all stuff to go. And I, 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 don't know how, I don't know how I'm going to make ends meet at the end of the month. And I have no idea what's going to happen with my kids into the future. Next year, 2020, was like, what's 2021 going to be like? And uh, I lost my job. And I don't know how we're going to get another job. But all these questions. And Jesus comes along. And in his compassion, he asks the question. Why are you worried? Why are you worried? In other words, what have we forgotten that's moved us to a place of worry? And over and over and over again in the New Testament, we read about do not worry. Don't worry. Do not worry. A lot of these questions are obviously very interchangeable, but Jesus says this in Matthew 6, verse 28. He says, he says why are you anxious about clothing? And uh, today we put so many other things in there besides clothing. Why are you anxious about, and then fill in the blank. Why are you anxious about 2021? Why are you anxious about December? Why are you anxious about if you spoke about cars? Why are you anxious about your problems? Why are you anxious about your children's future? Why are you worried? Why are you anxious? And then he says, consider. Again, this is where we consider. And I'm giving us a little bit of a key of what it looks like to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. It's to stop long enough to start to consider. Yeah. To consider Him, to consider His ways, to consider His character, to consider who Jesus is. As we consider, we start to grow in, in our faith again. We start to be encouraged inside of us. And instead, we start to be strengthened inside of us. We open the Word of God and say, I'm going, to, I'm going to read it until there's a promise that I can hold up to. And you might say, well, I have no promise. Well, you know what? Just grab any verse and make it your own and make it your promise. But I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. I don't feel like God's really speaking to me. Well, then just pick one. Amen. Pick a verse. And just make a decision. Well, I'm, I'm going to, I don't feel like I've got a lot of faith, but I'm going to just 
decide that this is going to be the verse that God's speaking to me through. So I'm going to take this verse and I'm going to hold on to it until the angels sing the heavens open and God speaks to me with a loud voice. Amen. I'm going to say hold that verse because he already spoke. He already spoke through 1,189 chapters worth of the Bible. I'll stay away from Leviticus and Numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're an accountant. Um, but he's already spoke, he's spoken to, he's spoken to his book, he's given it to you, it's true. And uh, I believe that as we do that, as we deliver about that, it's going to become more and more personal. Yes. Personal. This guy who's six out of eleven, I was having a chat with him yesterday afternoon, and uh, he said, he said, God has become so personal in his life. He said, when he, when he, when he began to like accept the fact, like he said, he said they got like, I need, I need to get, I need something to drink. And then he said, drink, right? And then when that happens and he gets something to drink, he remembers, but I, 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 I needed this at some point. I asked God for it, now I have it. And, uh, and the more he does it, the more he, he is starting to see God moving in his life. If we're not seeing him moving, we're not going to see him moving. But if we choose, even in the silly little that make things to see God moving, we will see him moving. Yes. Over and over and over again. That's what considering looks like. So Jesus says to his disciples, why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. But Jesus is not saying, do nothing. <laughs> oh, that's cool. God is going to sit back and watch Netflix all day. I'm not going to toil nor spin. It's perhaps getting too much work to impress the remote. Uh, that's not, we know that that would be true in the context of Scripture. But what he's going after is that, that it, it, it is, it is, it the last thing he says is went after busyness. Um, as we are just busy, 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 toiling and spinning. And here are these flowers, and God, God dresses them better than Solomon was dressed in all his glory. And what is Jesus saying? He's saying, uh, I've, got, I've got this. I've got you. You're going to be okay. You'll have clothing. You'll have a place to sleep. You'll, you'll be all right. Why are you anxious about dot, dot, dot? I've got this. I've got this. But Jesus, no, no, no. I know. I've got this. Why are you anxious? Can we hear a master say that to us today? As he, speak, as he asks those questions, he's speaking truth into us. He's speaking truth to the skull, the, the lies. The fifth question. What happened to your gratitude? I was asking myself, I'm saying you were going to ask myself a question too. What happened to your gratitude? What happened to your gratitude? Thankfulness is humility. Walking in humility looks like I'm able to say thank you. Because when I don't say thank you, it's kind of like I deserved it. When I don't say thank you, I'm in a place of entitlement and self-righteous deserving of what it is that comes my way. I don't know why I deserve this because I fasted for 60, 60 days this year. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry if you were so slow about it. I was, I was really fast. I saw my fast in the morning and done by lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it took you 60 days to finish. But <laughs> <laughs> um, but this, that thankfulness recognizes that it's only by His grace. Yeah. Anything that comes my way is not even, you might say, well, I, I did something. So even the fact that we're able to do some things is by His grace. The fact that he was able to give us the ability to work, the ability to do whatever it is, is by his grace. Thankfulness is humility. And thankfulness sanctifies the trial. Sanct thankfulness, you know, uh, Paul would say, when, you, when there's food sacrificed to idols, uh, okay, that, that you don't get problems with food to be sacrificed to idols. So what do you do? You give thanks for the food. And you can eat it with a, with a clean conscience. Because thankfulness, the prayer of thankfulness sanctifies the food. It made the food holy. It set the food apart. Now it's no longer sacrificed to idols. Now it's, now it's God's. Now it's holy and set apart. Thankfulness sanctifies the trial. You're facing a trial. You're facing a situation. It's terrible. As soon as we start to say thank you to God in the midst of our situations, what happens is we start to sanctify the trial. Our together would say you dignify the trial. You dignify the trial. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. It sanctifies the trial and it disarms the power of hell. When the enemy comes in and, he, and he's trying to have his way in our lives, we start to give thanks to God in, 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 the, in those moments. We disarm the power of the enemy. When we are grumpy and moaning and complaining, we empower again the enemy in our lives. Yeah. When we say thank you, he's, this, he's lost his power. He's lost his power. If Job had learned that faster, his book might have not been so long and so hard to read. 
Thankfulness sacrificed the child, this part, this arm to the power of God. Thankfulness also kills envy, gets rid of envy, because if I'm walking in a place of thankfulness, I'm not walking in a place of the one I am uh, looking around and seeing what I don't have. Thankfulness also kills entitlement and it kills the victim mentality in our lives. Um, I'm such a victim of our circumstances. And we need to be in a place of thankfulness. God, I, I thank you for what you've given me. And I can't think of anything to give thanks for. Well, just give thanks if you are grieving. And we should be able to do beyond that. We should be able to start, but we can start somewhere. It's like, I don't have a scripture that I want to. Well, just pick one. I, I don't know what to say thank you to. Well, thank you, Lord, that I woke up this morning. Thank you, God, that even in the midst of a, a global pandemic, we were, we were able to gather together as brothers and sisters in the glory and in worship. You know, our, so many of our pe- people that we know and we love around the world are unable to gather for that. We're, we're gathered. We can th- thank you, God, for that. Um, I've been feeling grumpy because I'm going to fight my wife. What just happened and the, the, my car wheel came off as, as I rode. I only arrived here with three wheels. And this, 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 and the, my world is in such a oh, 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 oh. Thank you, God, I want to be here. That's fear. Um, we're not victims of our circumstances. All that happens is we stop being thankful when we start to feel that pain. There's this incredible, um, uh, there's an article I read a couple of weeks ago. It says victimhood has become the new social status. Victimhood has become the new so- social status. It's hard to get out of my mind. Victimhood has become the new social status. Um, and it's like, well, if I'm a victim, if, I, if I'm hard done by, well, that's, you know, that's, that's what I put on Facebook, that's what I put on Instagram, that's what I put on my social media. It's like, who, who's the bigger victim today? You've got the higher social ranking in the world, you know? And uh, there's one very simple solution to that problem, and that is thankfulness. Thankfulness. And it deals with, deals with the time, and pride, and envy, and all those things. Luke 17, verse 14 to 16, um, Jesus, he, uh, there's 10 members that come to him and ask, and, and they want to be healed. And Jesus says, go, you can go very well, you can go well, very well, go and show yourself to the priest. So verse 4 says, so when he saw them, he said, then go show yourself to the priest. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. There's another side issue there, that we'll think about actually doing what he tells us to do. As we take steps of faith, his grace comes. So we take steps, tells us to do something, we do that little thing he tells us to do. Just a little simple process of walking in a different direction as we start to do what is, what is, what is said. Even if it be whatever simple thing it is, just, just do the one thing, do the one thing. And um, His grace is there. His grace empowers us in that. Um, so as they went, they were cleansed. They were cleansed. So that, so that means they were all made well. Every single one of these ten letters were made well. The next verse is incredible. Verse 50. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. The Bible doesn't miss words, it adds it in. And he was a Samaritan, which kind of tells us that maybe some of the others were Samaritans, they were Jews. They should have known better. Yeah. But this Samaritan, this, this guy who's like an outcast in society, comes back to this Jewish man and he says, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And Jesus is kind of like, he's like, he's got this like, like incredulous statement that he makes and he says, Can you get up? My resident is at the peacock out there. He's got he's this incredulous statement where he says, Were there not ten of you? Yet only one of you has come. Yeah. Um, and then he says, Go your way, you being made well. For me, when I see that, I see that that being made well was healing the whole man. Not just the physical uh, leprosy that was healed, but healing on the inside. That thankfulness healed them on the inside. So the other, the other nine, they got a physical healing, but they were still in the same place, they were still in the same whatever turmoil they had going on inside, that hadn't changed. Uh, that, 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 that brokenness on the inside, that was still there. But this, this man who, and he was a Samaritan, he came back to Jesus and said, Thank you, Jesus is going away. You, you've been made well. You've been made well. Body, soul, spirit, heal that. Heal that. Thankfulness heals us up. Thankfulness is God's way. I know it's simple, but as human beings, have we forgotten to say thank you? Thank you. Even when we look back on 2020, we look back and say, Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Even in the chaos, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for, and you can fill in the blanks. You know, uh, there's so many things in different situations. One of the things for me was could be, thank you, God, that I got to spend so much time with uh, my two, my two, my two little boys, and be around a lot more with, with the new one. And just before this, if we're locked up, those moments that will probably never happen again. Uh, and 
there's so much we can be thankful for. We just stop, stop and think. Um, about our life, about our kids, about our parents, about our friends, about where we live. Uh, <laughs> we live in the South Coast, it's either too hot or too cold or too whatever. It's not raining, and then it's raining too much. And there's so much we can just stop and just, just be thankful. We be thankful we'll start to see. We'll start to see what God wants to do even on our coast, yeah. in our communities, because our language is changing. Final question. Why have you forgotten? Why have you forgotten? Jesus speaking to his disciples and he's dealing with a, a particular issue, but in the verse 17 of Mark 8, he says, being aware of what the disciples were saying to each other, because they were a little bit confused what Jesus had said, he said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? That's the first question. Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear, and do you not remember? There's a, that's a barrage of questions from Jesus. Like Jesus, like, I am so confused right now. <laughs> um, and because they were like, he's talking about the level of the Pharisees, we can bring bread, that is kind of what was going on, but they completely missed the point. Anyway, Jesus goes after what they missed and asks them all these questions, and then tells them about the five loaves and two fish, and with the five thousand, he tells them the seven loaves, and with the four thousand. The question I want to want to just grab hold to was is this question I do not remember. Do you not remember? Because we might find ourselves sometimes in a place where I don't have eyes to see. We might find ourselves in another place where we go, my, my ears aren't here. I'm not hearing anything. Like, like God's, not, God's not speaking to me. I'm going to put up your hand if God's not speaking to you right now. I'm joking, don't forget. Don't want to cry. <laughs> but that's it. If you feel like God's not speaking to you, come talk to me. I'd love to pray with you. Have to work these things through. These things we need to work through with each other, work through in community. Anyway, Jesus asked the question, do you not remember? If you might, we might not be able to see something, we might not be able to hear something. We might not be able to perceive. But surely we can remember. Surely we can remember something. Something what he's done. But I've forgotten. Well, maybe we can remember something. There must be something we can remember. Jesus reminds him of the, these two moments when he multiplies the food. What is it in your life? And what it is in my life? We might not be able to see, we might not be able to hear, but we can remember. We can remember the past, we can remember our history with God, we can remember what he did for us that day. We're facing this relational challenge, but I remember we broke through in that area, in that relationship. We're facing this um, you know, challenge at, at work with the way people are treating me. But I remember how God sorted things out over there. And I've seen, I, I, I've, I've lived by now long enough to see impossible situations bow their knee to Jesus. Yeah. See impossible situations turn around. And I know the older we get, the more we see we, we, we see of that. And we need to be able to just stop sometimes and just remember, okay, right now life is chaos. I'm in the middle of the storm. There's so much on the go. I'm asking why. And Jesus is saying, do you remember what I've done? Do you remember? Do you remember my work in your life? Do you remember how I came through for you in that area? His faithfulness in our lives, because he, he can't deny himself. He, he, he was always faithful, and he will always be faithful. Can we remember? This is the compassion of Jesus to ask us questions so that we can come back into a place of alignment with him and with his character. We do what the disciples do so often, don't we? We miss the point, we mumble amongst ourselves, we get all confused, and Jesus just comes in and just speaks truth, and he does it do it in one word, do it in one question. And uh, I hope that today, as we've looked through some of these questions, that it's been helpful for you guys. Now, I am kind of heading towards where the, 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 the thing I'd like us to remember as we leave today. Um, so I need us just to focus and concentrate for 10 more minutes. Is that okay? Um, I want to, before, before I do, I want to just read, read the story of uh, the governor of Mississippi. This is two weeks ago, it's on his Facebook page. And I thought it was it's just so incredible. Um, he made this remarkable statement. He said this. He said, it is, His name is Ted Reeves. He said, It is fair to say this last week and a half has been firstly for me the most difficult of 2020. So this is early, this is like the middle of, um, of November he wrote this now, so about two weeks ago. Um, but it's fair to say that this last week and a half, personally for me, has been the most difficult of 2020. A year that we can all agree has by its very nature been tough on all of us. Um, he explains, He said, my, my two oldest girls. Have been by themselves in self isolation since the Wednesday after Halloween. My youngest tested positive, along with many other precious spirits and, and, and classmates. His family's difficulties, along with all that he faces as a governor um, in these days, have obviously been very hard and very painful for him. As a result, he admits this. He says, I wanted to feel sorry for myself. 
Let me open it in the first. Yeah. God, I'm the God of Mississippi, you know. Uh, I wanted to feel sorry for myself. I wanted to focus on the challenges. This right here, this is what it looks like to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. This is what it looks like to some questions, where we could question God, where we go, actually, there's another way. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to feel sorry for myself. I wanted to focus on the challenges. Honestly, I wanted to focus on all the negatives, but then I prayed. When he did, God put the book of Isaiah on our hearts, specifically Isaiah 41 verse 10. God loves to speak to his children. Yeah. Isaiah 41 verse 10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. How is that an answer from heaven in a moment of need? And God, God spoke to take these, this man on the other side of the world who has his own challenges and his own problems. He can speak like that to you and to me. And we can move out of this place of, of uh, confusion and bitterness and offense and, and self pity and victimhood and move into a place of I trust you, God. Yeah. I trust you, God. Um, so he says this as, as, as he ended off his words. He said, We are going to get through these tough times. We are going to persevere. We are going to come out even stronger on the other side. Why? Because God is with us and God is our strength and our refuge. We go back to where we started um, with 1 Samuel 30 two weeks ago. I know we haven't turned it today. So if you want to, you can turn to 1 Samuel 30, but if you don't want to, you can just listen. Um, and I want to just read a few verses when David and then get back everything that they lost. So 1 Samuel 30. So I'm not going to read the back story. David strengthens himself in the Lord and then decides we're going to go after these people. We're going to pursue and we're going to get everything back. And so they find a bump into somebody who knows where they went and they end up uh, finding, these, finding where these guys are. And uh, verse um, 17 says this. It says, And David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. That's a long time. <laughs> I just love that the enemies of God get like, like this, this, we're not going to make this video. We're going to do this all day until the evening of the next day. So that's a long time. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. I always wonder how they escaped on camels. I'm sure they camels are not, not a quick way to escape. But they escaped on camels all the way. Couldn't that be a very comfortable ride? So David recovered all. I want this to say all. David recovered all that their Malachites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. David knew how to strengthen himself in the Lord. Psalm 42, verse 5 6 says this. David says, speaking to himself, he says, Why? Asking himself a question. Why they question God? He questions himself. Why are you cast down in our soul? Why do you feel the way you feel? Why are you so depressed? Why are you in turmoil within me? And then he says, Hope in God, I shall remain. Praise God. My salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I will remember you. Yeah. My soul is cast down, so I remember. I reflect. I consider. I remember. Maturity is the ability to question ourselves and not God, and then anchor the questions that we have in the character. Now, that's a process, and we don't, we, uh, it's not about feeling guilty when we question God. When we, when we ask God questions, we need to come back to this place of strengthening ourselves in Him. And moving back to that place of, but God, but God, His character. So David was greatly distressed, but in a strengthening himself in the Lord, he had the six questions in the answer, in the answer way. He kept his eyes on God. He encouraged himself in God. He acted in faith. He went to recover. He acted in faith. He walked in peace and thankfulness, and his memory of what God had done in the past gave him the confidence to pursue and recover all. He knew who his God was. And I really believe this. I believe that this is a season to recover all and all the sides. Yeah. This is a season to recover all the sides. I'm going to ask us all to stand. And I want to pray for this. And then I want to land with what I wanted to say from the very beginning. Uh, but this is how we'll come back. I'll say it now. (laughs) 
So God, we have looked at these things today. We've heard uh, your words and the questions that you ask us. And we've looked at David's story. And I pray, Lord, today for every single person in this room that they will find the way to strengthen themselves in you. Every single person here. Every single, every single one of us, every one of us. This is, this is family here together. We go through stuff and we go through things. But God, come and have your way and present yourself amongst us. Lord, may we strengthen ourselves in you. May we strengthen ourselves in you. May our eyes be turned back to you, God. May we walk in thankfulness again. May we learn how to say thank you. May we walk in faith. And may we trust in you, Lord God. May we not be worried. And may we remember what you've done. Strengthening ourselves. I pray for strength for every single person. And I declare and speak today that this is a season of recovering all and more. When David went out and he conquered that, that army, they recovered everything and more. They recovered all the stuff that, that, that belonged to the enemy. And that stuff all became theirs too. And I thank you, Lord. This is a season to recover all. I speak recovery into every one of our lives right now in Jesus' name. Recovery. With things have been stolen, things have been taken, with 2020 maybe feels like a year of loss in our lives. Lord, that this, that this year will be turned around for a year of gain, a year, a year of prosperity, inside and outside, in our souls and outside of the physical. That we will be a people of God who, who, uh, who carry you. That we will be a people of God who are able to do what you call us to do. That we will be able to live out of the fullness of the resources of heaven. And we'll see the recovery of all in Jesus' name. That which has been stolen will be recovered in Jesus' name. So I speak that. I speak recovery. Amen. Speak recovery. Speak restoration where there was loss. In the area of health, we speak recovery. We speak restoration in Jesus' name. Healing where there was a health issues in Jesus' name. In the area of finances, an increase where there, was, where there were things taken and stolen and removed from us. Where, where things have been stolen through various ways, maybe through yeah, that's happened because of the virus, when we lost the job, things happened, that uh, there is a recovery and there is a restoration. I pray God for better jobs, for those who lost jobs, for better jobs in Jesus' name, that they will find themselves in an even better place than they were before. They'll find a place in a place where they can thrive, where they can be fulfilled on the inside, where they will find that their life's purpose is, is able to be outworked through what it is that they get to do every single day. I speak an end to the mundane and the mediocre, and I, and I, I speak an increase of, of just the life of God in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Recovery, restoration, fruitfulness, abundance, abundance. Paul says in Romans, he says that we will rule and reign in life. And I speak that over our lives, that we will have the ability to rule and to reign in life. The ability to rule and to reign in life in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Don't, don't sit. Don't sit. I really believe that we're going to start to hear stories and testimonies of recovery. And when we start to hear those stories, we're going to celebrate the stories. We're not going to say, but God, why, why then? Why not me? Why don't you do it? And surely I need that more. But we're going to celebrate. And we're going to say thank you. And we're going to give God glory for what He's doing amongst us. We're going to give God glory for what He's doing in people's lives. Some people have really been trusting God for years and years and years for breakthrough. Uh, maybe it's breakthrough in your job. Maybe it's breakthrough in your family. Maybe it's breakthrough in uh, a particular challenge that you've personally struggled with in your life over and over and over again. And breakthrough is going to come. And restoration is going to come in Jesus' name. The biggest question of why that was asked in the Bible was asked by Jesus. This, this really is the crux of the matter. Jesus hanging on the cross, taking all our shame, all our guilt, all our sin upon himself hung there on the cross, and in that moment of shame, in that moment of becoming the sin of the world, God left him. And Jesus asked them the, the biggest why question that could ever be asked. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, this, this relationship that Jesus had with his Father, that was always, I know that my Father hears me. The Father and Jesus were, they've been one, they've been together since, since forever before. And this moment in his life where Jesus says, I guess you for the sake of the loss of thine will, for the sake of you and me, I will take it all upon myself. But I don't think Jesus even knew what it was going to be like, what it was going to feel like. He's in the garden of Gethsemane. He says, please take it away if you can, God. But not your will, but my will be done. And he goes to the cross and he hangs there. And the, 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 I, I think the, the harder thing than taking us in upon ourselves is the rejection of the Father. Yeah. He says, why have you forsaken me? Jesus faced the rejection of the Father so you and I can have the acceptance of the Father. 
He faced the shame and the guilt so you and I could walk in freedom and joy and righteousness. He faced everything on the cross that you and I go through so that we could walk in life and life in abundance. He asked the biggest why question on behalf of all humanity so that you and I could experience the presence of God in our lives minute by minute, day by day, moment by moment. And so I want us to remember today as we, as we, as we finish off, as we wrap up, as we're about to leave this building, remember what Jesus went through. Consider him. Consider him. Consider what he had to go through to even ask, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? Because that will give us the courage and the strength that we need to push through into the next moment, into the next day, into this last month of this year, and into a year ahead. And we have absolutely, we have, we have less confidence in what we have, less of us in our work. We, we, um, I'm just kind of naming 2021 the year of flexibility. We kind of went into 2020 with some plans, didn't we? Um, it's really hard to think of any plans going into 2021. There's so much uncertainty, so much, so much that's so unsure. But we have God. And he knows, and he holds the future, the past, and the present in his hands. And Jesus faced the rejection of God so that you and I can experience the acceptance of God. Amen. So we go into this new year accepted in the world. We go into this new year knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Amen. And we go into this new year knowing that everything that we need for life and for Godliness, He has given us. I want to, I want to just do more aggressive for you. Lord, just come to front quickly. I hope I'm not making you guys stand too long, so okay, I just know it's easier to stay away from standing too, so. Um, but I really believe it's just, just a few things, we've just got to let it settle. Um, I need an house map quickly, do you want an house map for me? Is it house map for me? It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty cool, yeah. Um, just a question, please monitor, please monitor, is that? <laughs> I was kind of hoping you'd want to be like, sorry, I'm a thousand man first before you remember that given to my wallet. I just sporadically gave it as quickly as I came to the front just now. I was just like, can you just keep this on in my pockets? Sometimes we forget what we have in our pockets. We forget what God has given us. And today it really is a reminder of what God has given us. It's a reminder of what, what it is that you and I carry. That actually everything that, that we need to go into the, the future, we already have. When God asks you and I for something, when he, did, when, he, when he pulls something from us, when we face a situation and he's asking something of us in this situation, he's saying, but I don't have it. God said, I've already given it to you. Amen. I've already given it to you. I don't have a thousand minutes. I know you do. You have a thousand minutes in your pocket right now. I've already given it to you. And God didn't know that there were many, unfortunately, he knows me. We, we, we've been friends for a long time. He didn't know there was a thousand minutes in their pocket. And he was like, they didn't give me my wallet. So, so he gave me his wallet. So maybe, maybe. maybe. And uh, that, that's my prayer for every single one of us today. That we will think like that. But God says, but I need that. And this is what I'm asking of you in this situation. God, this is so hard. I can't, I can't forgive that person. I'm asking you to. I'm asking you to. And, and, and then we remember that he's given us all we need to be able to do that. He's given us all we need to be able to answer the question, to be able to make the decision, to be able to step out of faith, to be able to be thankful. To be able to step into whatever it is that we need to step into. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I bless every single one of us here today with that. I bless every single person with the courage, with boldness, and with the resources that are needed for the future.